So tonight I want us to go back to the shepherd's field. And we got a few more messages and so I could preach for a year off of every little uh, blade of grass of, of this 23rd Psalm is so nutrient filled and so rich, almost word by word. And even starting with verse one, the Lord, just starting with the Lord. Nothing, if you get the Lord, you got it. Amen. And the rest of it is just explaining what it is with having the Lord. And we talked about how he is my shepherd. And we talked about how that he came down from the glories of heaven to the dirt and dust of the shepherd's field of which we live in. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me. And sometimes uh, we, we don't want to slow down, but he makes us to slow down in order for us to chew the cud. Chew the cud where we can digest and ingest. People say, well, I don't think I got to go to church, all that. Uh, you know what going to church all this time is doing? It's just chewing the cud and, and getting uh, stronger and getting more and more from the Lord. He's got, tell somebody, he's got more for you. Amen. We talked about how that sheep are directionless. They don't know how to find their way home. Sheep are dependent. They've got to have somebody to care for them. They're not self-sufficient like many predators and animals are. And we are called sheep. Tell somebody, you are one of his sheep. Amen. And we talked about how he restores. Uh, we've been, Sister Judy's a testimony to that. And uh, oil for the sick sheep and, and staff for the straying sheep. And thank God he draws me closer. A rod for the stubborn sheep. And he disciplines. Uh, and we talked about how he leads us. Uh, he doesn't drive us. He leads us. Uh, you know, he'll let you have your way if you want to have your way. But uh, you, you know that his way, the shepherd's way, is the best way. Amen. So tonight, we come to a valley. We come to a valley. So Psalm 23 is the most quoted chapter in the Bible. But verse 4, of which we're focusing in on tonight, is probably the most quoted verse of the Bible. And from this, I have to tell you, we've got some bad news. We've got some bad news. But I want to talk to you tonight that there is a valley. There's bad news. And it's called the valley of death. But I've got tonight... Uh, the best news about the worst news. Would you stand with me tonight? The best news about the worst news. The Lord is my shepherd, and I believe we will find the best news about the worst news. So we're going to go back and read uh, Psalm 23 out loud, everyone. Read it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How can you not get blessed by that? Go back to verse 4, Haley. Uh, it says together. Verse 4, ready, read. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The best news about the worst news. Father, thank you tonight that we are your sheep of your pasture. And you're leading us in these times of pandemic and times of car accidents and doctor's diagnosis. God, you are faithful. And Father, anoint your servant to preach the ever-living, everlasting word of God. And I'll give you the praise for it. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. And as you're being seated, remind them you're one of God's sheep. Amen. In Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 25, it says, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. And in these times of wars, pandemics, 
high gas prices. According to this passage, people are thirsting for some good news from a father's or a shepherd's country. And here in the 23rd Psalms, we find good news from a far country, the shepherd's country. But it's coming on the heels of the worst news. Because we're dealing tonight with the valley of the shadow of death. You know, good news, bad news. Sort of like the doctor who said to his patient, he said, I got good news and I got bad news. He said, the good news is that we've discovered what your problem is and you have three days to live. He said, that's the good news? What in the world could be the bad news? He said, we tried to reach you two days ago. Now, what is the worst of news? For the average person, the worst of news is not $5 a gallon of gas. The worst of news is not a COVID diagnosis. However, the worst of news for all of us, we could agree, is the death of a loved one or maybe even the death of ourselves. Everyone is afraid, seemingly, of the grim reaper. That unknown day, that unknown hour. Someone said that life is like a lightning swift swing of the pendulum of the clock of time. Life is like the stay of the postman at the door. Someone said life is a snowflake that is like this, a snowflake that falls from the heavens and it shines in its beauty for a moment, touches the raging stream of water and vanishes. Someone said that life is like the sparks that fly upward from the bonfire. They flame for a moment against the night sky and then are extinguished forever. Death is the worst news. But we have security. We have a Savior. And we have a shepherd. And because of this, we've got the best news about the worst news. I wish somebody would give the Lord a hand of praise tonight for the best news. About the worst news. I have two points tonight. But don't get excited. Because those two points are subdivided with about five points. But I'm just glad I got a point. Amen. Number one. We're talking about valleys tonight. First of all, God leads us to the valley. Say that with me. God leads us to the valley. Now we're talking about the valley of the shadow of death. But I want to also broaden this tonight if I can. And talk about valleys in general. You see we find them mentioned throughout the scriptures. Valleys and valley experiences are a fact of Life. In fact, Psalm 23 is a valley psalm because if you go to Psalm 22, there is the mountain of Calvary. In Psalms 24, there is the mountain of glory where the Lord is righteous. But in between two mountains, there is always a valley. Valleys are not a bad thing. They are a thing. Fact. And uh, Joshua talks about the valley of calamity. Psalms 84 talks about the valley of weeping. Uh, Joel talks about the valley of decision. There are valleys uh, throughout uh, the scriptures and valleys throughout our life. In fact, uh, valleys are inevitable. Uh, uh, they're just going to happen. You might as well count on the fact. Uh, oh, you're on the mountaintop today. Uh, oh, praise God, you were dancing around in the circles this morning. Uh, you're on the mountaintop today. Uh, but valleys are inevitable uh, until we reach that home beyond the shepherd's fold, uh, the shepherd's field. Uh, valleys happen throughout our life. They are not only inevitable, they are unpredictable. You can't plan them. You can't schedule them. Have you ever, have you ever had a flat tire at a good time? Do you ever have a car wreck right when you needed it, <laughs> Sister Judy? <laughs> Valleys are unpredictable. One day they just arrive. Uh, one minute we're going wide open. Uh, and two years ago about this time, uh, we're shutting church down. We didn't know it for almost two and a half months. Some churches uh, uh, remain closed for almost two years. Uh, valleys are inevitable. They are unpredictable. And I'll tell you something else. They are impartial. Uh, no one is immune to them. No one is insulated from pain. Uh, no one. That's why we love the 23rd Psalm. Because we all have been. 
or are going through the valleys of life. You see, everybody has problems. Good people, bad people, problems, trials, difficulties, disturbances, downtimes, depression. Doesn't mean you're a bad person just means you're a person. Uh, if you're living, uh, you're going to go through a valley. Valleys are not only impartial, they are thankfully purposeful. Say that with me. Purposeful. They have uh, a purpose. Uh, you see, uh, uh, there is a reason God sends us through the valley. In fact, many people do not know this. Uh, and I did this in my study that, uh, you see, there is a valley in the land of Palestine. It starts as a spring up between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It's about 2,700 feet above sea level. And over the centuries, uh, this constantly flowing water has cut what is a what we know as a little Grand Canyon, not like the one we have but it's over there it's like almost like a little grand canyon and from 2700 feet above sea level it flows down to 1300 feet below sea level right into the dead sea and so the shepherds named this canyon guess what they named it the valley of the shadow of death literally there's a literal valley of the shadow of death because it's very narrow at the bottom in fact, it's only 12 feet wide in some places. And even at high noon, it is filled with shadows. There are caves in this valley, shadowy places, mountain lions, hyenas, bears even get in there. Uh, there are oftentimes robbers uh, and bandits would hide in those uh, jagged uh, places where the rocks and steep places uh, where the sheep could easily fall. Uh, and it was a frightening place uh, with grotesque shadows. Uh, and every now and then a shepherd would have to lead his flock uh, through this canyon, uh, often to get to a better place. Somebody say a better place. Uh, but I under, understand there is a place literally called the valley valley of the shadow of death uh, and the shepherd knew what he was doing uh, and sometimes uh, he leads us to a valley and you may be led to a valley but God is still your shepherd uh, and there is good news about the worst news uh, can you say amen but not only are valleys in inevitable not only are they unpredictable not only are they impartial and purposeful but valleys are say that last word temporary because point number one God leads us to the valley point number two God will always lead us through the valley. I'm going to get through this pain. I'm going to get through this problem. I'm going to get through this uh, this place of restriction and danger where there are hyenas and the lion uh, of uh, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'm not going to get through that valley because of me, but because the Lord is my shepherd and he will take that rod and defend me and he'll take that staff and draw me close to himself Oh, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times, and His praise will, shall continually be in my mouth. They sung a song several years ago when I was a teenager in the church that says this, I'm going to walk right out of this valley. Lift my hands and praise the Lord. Said, I ain't going to let old Satan get me down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? Heavens are waiting up a little bit higher. I'm going to walk right out of this valley with my Lord. Amen. Verse 1 says, Now when the Lord let down the hedge on Job to try him, took all of his children and everything that he owned. But Job didn't sit down and cry. He lifted his head up high, and he came out of that valley, thank God, with a whole lot more. Verse 2 says, Now the road that we've got to travel to that city, it won't always be on the mountain high. But you know the valley we've got to face. God said he'll give us grace to come up where the sun is shining bright. I'm going to walk right out of this valley. Lift my hands and praise the Lord. I'm not going to let old Satan get me down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? Heavens are waiting a little bit higher. I'm going to walk right out of this valley with my, with my Lord. Somebody give him my hand of praise tonight. We're coming through the valley. You see, valleys are temporary. And you may be going through an extended valley. That's okay. Warren Wiersbe said, when God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock 
and his hand on the thermostat. Oh, thank the Lord. There is an end to them. And let me talk to you about death itself and then close out with the daily or the general valleys of life because this is a mention of death. And I, I, many people take the 23rd Psalm and they, they put it so many times in the funeral and really the Psalm is not about death. It is about life. But we do deal with death. You see, death, I have found out, it is a stubborn event. Psalm 23 and 4 says, yay. It didn't say nay. <laughs> yay. If you're living tonight, it's a stubborn event. And unless the Lord raptures the church, you will be the guest of honor at Joiner's funeral home one day. Or over at Shingleton's or somewhere else. De Hebrews 9 and 27 is appointed unto men once to die. Ten out of ten people will die. You see, death is a stubborn event, and it is an uncertain event. What do we mean? Because David says he's walking through the valley, and it's, it's a picture as, as, as us walking through life, and we're not sure what how far we've got to go. First Samuel 23 says, there is but a step between me and death. Folks, please understand that tonight. I know we believe in life. I know we believe in the life giver. I know we believe in eternity when we all get to heaven. But the truth of the matter is we do not know if today is our last day. There is one breath away, one heartbeat away. There is but a step between me and death. Uh, and that's why you must. I was talking to Haley this afternoon uh, as a 16-year-old young lady who's been in church all her life. Uh, don't take it for granted. Uh, make your calling and election sure. Make sure sure you don't have churchianity, uh, grandma's religion. Uh, make sure you know Jesus Christ yourself uh, as your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you are facing an uncertain event uh, called death, and, and uh, sometimes a little child drops its toys uh, to grapple the iron uh, uh, fist of death. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, old people die, but sometimes mothers kiss their helpless babies goodbye. Uh, I have to preach as a dying man to dying men because this could be the last sermon I preach and it could be the last sermon you hear. I'm not trying to be morbid or put a downcast on it. No, there is light in the darkness. Uh, James tells us, uh, look here, you people. James chapter 4, verse 13 and 15. It says, look here, you people who say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city, continue there a year and buy and sell uh, and get gain. Uh, verse 14 says, uh, whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow, for what shall it profit your life? It is a vapor that appeareth for a little while, and then it vanishes away. Death, uh, it is a stubborn event. It is an uncertain event, and it is a personal event. Amen? He said, yea, though I walk. He didn't say, yea, though they walk. <laughs> but notice, he says, he walks through the valley of the... Shout it out for me. Say shadow. shadow. Let the live stream folks hear shadow because as I alluded to a moment ago death to the child of God it is stubborn it is certain it is uh, uh, personal but there is even in the grave a light Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2 Isaiah 9 and verse 2 the people that uh, have uh, walked in darkness uh, Heart, walked in the valley, have seen a great light. And they that dwell in the valley of the shadow of death, oh, upon them the light has shined. Oh, Christian, there is light at the grave of brother, uh, uh, our dearly beloved scholar. There is light at the grave at our loved ones, brother Bud and sister Joan. There's a bright light shining. Lift up your heads and, and uh, dry those tears. Yes, we shed tears of sorrow, of missing. Uh, but ultimately belief there's a bedrock of truth uh, that yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death uh, I will fear no evil uh, because he's with me uh, even in that event called death somebody give him a mighty hand of praise here tonight there was a writer called O. Henry literally O. Henry 
And he was a short story writer and he was dying. And into his room a servant came and began to dim the lights. O. Henry said, turn up the lights. I don't want to go home in the dark. And my friend, you don't have to go home in the dark. Amen. Hallelujah. Because when you're, are you in the valley? Then, and is there a shadow? Then you've got a choice. You can look, listen, anytime there's a shadow, you can look at the shadow or you can look at the light. Amen. If you look to the light, the shadow will be behind you and you won't even see it. Oh, listen, uh, because he says, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Oh, notice up until this time, he's been talking about the Lord. Uh, he's been talking about the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord does this. He's talking about the Lord. Uh, but now when he's going through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, he stops talking about the Lord. Uh, he starts talking to the Lord. Uh, he's saying, you're with me, God. Uh, I'm not alone, God. Uh, you're my God. Uh, you're the Jehovah of verse 1. Uh, you're my almighty. Uh, you're of the rock. You're my light uh, in darkness. Uh, you just Jehovah, the ultimate, is Jehovah the intimate. He is with me tonight, church. Praise him that in the worst of news, we've got the best news. He's my personal shepherd. Amen. Then he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. Thy rod and thy staff. You see, the rod and the staff are symbols of power to the shepherd. When you, when you come to die as a child of God, I can promise you that the Lord will be with you. His presence will be there to see you through uh, to the other side because he said his rod will protect you. You know, his rod will, will chase away the demons of doubt, chase away the fears of failure. You know, when people are dying, the devil just wants to whisper, oh, you sinned back there in 1973. Oh, you, you had an affair. You, you smoked a, a reefer. You did this, that, or the other. It's not funny. But, uh, you, you know, he brings in all of these, uh, all of these sins. And, and uh, you, you gossiped. And you, you've got this, that, and the other. And you, what you've got to do is realize the shepherd. Uh, keep your eyes upon the shepherd. If you keep your eyes upon your own sins uh, and your own failures, uh, because none of us have been a perfect life. None of us have halos on this side of glory. But please, I want you to understand his rod, he will beat back those fears. He will beat back. And please understand, when they were going through those, those valleys in Palestine, that, those bears and those hyenas, he they would take those rods and they would use that to defend, the, to defend those sheep. You're not going through the valley alone. There is somebody fighting for you. You don't have let, let the Lord fight your battle. Battle. Uh, listen, old David had that shepherd's anointing. Uh, he said, when the bear came against uh, my sheep, uh, I slew him. Uh, how do you think he did it? He used that rod. Amen. Uh, he said, when that lion came, uh, he said, I did it even with my bare hands. Uh, oh, thank God for the rod. Uh, but we've got the hands of God uh, that's going to guide me and lead me. Oh, praise God. Uh, thou art with me. Amen. Uh, your rod and your staff. The rod beats back the enemy. And I said the rod will also be used for correction, didn't I? But the rod is not just to correct the sheep. The rod is also to protect the sheep and to beat those forces back. Amen. It was a little boy next door was picking on me one time. And, <clears throat> and I had to flee the scene because he was too strong for me. Well, next time my daddy stood where the boy couldn't see him. And I had a different attitude about it. Amen. You can do a lot of smack talk when, you, when your daddy's around. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. His rod and his staff. Please understand the staff, that crook in that rod, is to take that sheep and pull him close. I know we're supposed to draw nigh to God. I know we're supposed to reach out and touch the Lord. But let me tell you something tonight. You're his, fear not, little flock. You're one of his sheep. And in this service tonight, he's drawing you closer. He's drawing you to the cross. 
I know you've failed. I know you've sinned. I know you're afraid. I know we're in this world of trip, trouble and trial. Uh, but the shepherd is drawing us near. He's saying there's peace. Uh, there's victory. Uh, I'm your shepherd. Uh, and if I can take care of you in death, I can take care of you in life. Amen. And not only is death a stubborn event, an uncertain event, a personal event. Praise God. It is ultimately a triumphant event event. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians. I didn't see this until I was studying. I love to, to, to find new stuff. Pastor was talking about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 22 says, uh, and ye are Christ and uh, uh, Christ is God. But go back to verse 22, uh, Haley, if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 22, it says, uh, whether uh, Paul or Apollos, I'm not sure if she can pull that up or not, uh, but 1 Corinthians 3 and 22 says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. I know I'm hearing crickets tonight. It went over me too. I didn't quite pick it up. But it says, Life or death, things present or come, all are yours. And that tells me that death is mine. Now, I know you're not running the aisle. I know you're not shouting. Nobody wants to get on the next load out for death. And we shouldn't. We should want to live. There's a work to be done. For me to live is Christ. For me to be here is, is good for you. Amen. There's sermons to preach. I am, I'm just going to vent a little bit. I'm going to vent. I got one little thing I want to say that I don't agree with. But people who say that we've already heard enough sermons, that is not right. That is, we need another sermon. I'm glad to know that, in, listen, in 1984, millions of sermons have been preached. And somebody could have said, let's just worship. Let's not have any more preaching. I'm glad that didn't happen. Because I needed to hear one more sermon. Ricky Dems needed to hear the sermon to get saved. Amen. And you say, what, what, how many more sermons do we need? We need at least one more. Because there's a million more that need to be saved. Uh, always preach the word of God. Amen, somebody. And then let the Holy Ghost move. And then let the power fall. Uh, and then let the word of God uh, break every chain. Can I get a witness out here tonight? Uh, listen, uh, all things are yours. Death is yours. Uh, we are triumphant in life. Uh, praise God. I'm going to walk right out of this valley. And when I go through the valley of the shadow, death is not my enemy. It is my friend. In fact, the Bible says for me to live is Christ. But to die is, is to gain. Somebody say amen. How in the world can death be considered gain? Death is gain physically. Our bodies aren't made to live in this world. And we believe in healing. But and, and Moses walked to his own funeral. That's what I intend to do. I intend to walk to the casket, lay down in it, and pull the door over me. <laughs> That's how I'm going to go. <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> we don't know how it's going to happen. <laughs> but I tell you, I've seen, as a pastor, sick bodies. And I would see Judy Meeks come. And Brother Ray, I don't mean to make you cry tonight. <laughs> but they're tears of joy. And I would... I would pray for Sister Judy that God would open that mind and, and for eight years. And I think about Ronald Reagan died the same way. For the last 10 years of his life, he was in a bed, a vegetable. And I, but to me, to live is Christ. But to die is gain because physically there are those in wheelchairs, those with Down syndrome and, and, and those with disabilities, those who've been to war at Vietnam and had their legs blown off and all of the physical defects. The, I tell you, glasses just get on my nerves at this age of life. Amen. And uh, hearing age. And some of some of us need them. And my, me, number one, needs some. I, I go ahead and confess as I get older. But uh, all of the physical limitations of the body. Oh, my friend, death is gained because we're going to put aside those shackles. Uh, those limbs are going to be replaced. Uh, this earthly tabernacle will be dissolved. Uh, and yet we'll receive a building eternal uh, made by God Almighty. 
body. It's a glorified body, praise God. Uh, and you can sit out there if you want to. But I'm going to shout about it this morning or this night uh, that death uh, is gain physically. Amen. I'm looking forward to eating and not having to worry about my weight or my health. The cracker barrel of glory. Amen. People say, are we going to eat in heaven? You don't you better believe we're going to eat in heaven. Jesus, after he was resurrected, said, children, do you, uh, do you have any meat? Amen. And there's the marriage supper of the lamb. And Jesus said, we're going to sit at the table with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob. And we're going to tell the old great story. Come and die in the master call. Let me move on here. Death is gain physically. Death is gain intellectually. Because I'll be known as I am known. Death is gain emotionally because I'll be able to worship and praise him without restraint. Amen. Even when we worship here, we get a little bit exhausted. After church on Sunday night and we've played and sung and fellowshiped and preached and danced and hooped and hollered, uh, sit on that couch and our bodies just can't take but so much of this, of this world, of, in this world. Amen. But, oh, do you love to worship? Do you love to worship? Do you love the feeling of worship? Amen. People say, well, we don't need to base our faith on feeling, uh, but we need to have a faith that we can feel. Amen. Uh, if you're living, you're feeling. Uh, a dead person don't feel anything. You can pinch them, you can cut them, and they're going to sit right there. Like a lot of people on Sunday morning, they come in 11 o'clock sharp, and they leave 12 o'clock dull. Uh, you can't get a half of an amen out of them. By the time they say A, there's no man to follow it. Amen. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's not the way. The living, I say. The living, I say. They shall praise the Lord. Uh, I I'm alive in Jesus, and I'm going to throw off this body, and I'm going to dance like David danced. I'm going to shout like David shout. I'm going to rejoice without any inhibitions. The songwriter said it. I can only imagine what it will be when I, when I see him. Will I dance before you, Jesus, or will at your face I fall? Will I rejoice, or will I be able to do anything at all? I wish somebody say amen tonight. Socially. Death is gain. Did you think about that? Death is gain. Because in this world, we have to share this world with some, some people that are not very nice. And I don't want to be unkind. But in that world to come, you're not going to be in a place where Adolf Hitler is. There's not going to be an Osama bin Laden. You don't have to worry about an election being stolen in glory. And some of these evil people making evil just uh, judgments and unrighteous decrees and laws. Uh, and you're not going to have a next door neighbor that's going to play golf on Sunday while you're worshiping God and throw all their money away to things that won't last uh, while, while you're tithing and giving uh, faithfully to God. I'll tell you, heaven is going to be a social improvement. Amen. Uh, in fact, the, the writer of Isaiah speaks of it and says we're going to a place uh, where the wicked will cease their troubling. Every time I turn on a fire news and I see a pr White House pressing uh, and I see that lady up there spewing out that stuff, I get troubled. Uh, every time I hear of a Supreme Court uh, trying to rule and knock down the righteousness, uh, it trouble it ought to trouble you too. Uh, when I see people taking this country down, but I'm going to a place uh, where the wicked was. Uh, people get, you know what? They're tired of us. They don't like us. Uh, they just assume to kill us, get rid of us, shut us down. Uh, pra uh, 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 COVID was a trial run, uh, but they're, they're going to get their wish soon enough uh, because soon and very soon uh, Jesus is going to take the salt out of the earth uh, and you can have it brother but I'm walking out of this valley I'm going to be socially up uh, in, in a place uh, where the wicked won't, will cease their troubling uh, and the weary shall be at rest uh, I'm coming out of this valley death uh, is gain uh, when we know the shepherd amen somebody I am talking about death Please hear me. And we Christians are different when it comes to death. We react different. We think different. There's sorrow in death when people have no hope beyond the grave. It's terrible to see a young mother of, die of cancer. Melody Parnell, we went to Moorhead City and my thoughts were on Sister Melody. She was a member of my church at Smyrna. Uh, uh, she she never got married and 
and uh, she had beautiful talent. She could sing, and she would pray at our Monday night prayer meeting, and, and uh, she came down with cancer, and one day she was in her office, and somebody said, Melody, you look yellow. She went to the restroom, and her face and eyes were yellow, and she went across the street to the ER. They found a mass near her pancreas, and all of a sudden, a two-year journey. But I'll tell you what, she's with the Lord tonight, and we hate death. We hate cancer, and we hate those, and we pray against that. But our attitude towards death is different. Amen? At the end of the day, really, we ought to be a little jealous of Melody. She is with the Lord. Amen? <laughs> she ain't got to deal with $5 a uh, gallon gas. She don't have to see Jen Psaki on the White House press briefing and turn your stomach. Amen. Uh, and uh, she don't have to see the vice president laughing uh, a hideous laugh uh, in the face of calamity. And that's like the devil. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, we're going to a better place. Hallelujah. Oh, rejoice for those uh, who've stepped across this world uh, to this valley and into the shepherd's arms. Uh, safe uh, from all alarm. Uh, leaning on those everlasting arms. Uh, somebody praise the shepherd tonight. Ah, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, he's with me. But let me tell you, if, he'll, if he's going to take care of me in the afterlife, he's going to take care of me in this life. Aren't you glad of that tonight? So in this verse, as I close tonight, in this verse is a dual meaning. The valley of the shadow of death is speaking of death literally. But just like in Israel, it's also speaking of it physically. Are you going through a valley tonight? If we can face death, we can face anything. In fact, nobody is really re can really live until they know that they're ready to die. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. I thought this was so interesting as I close. And brother um, Quentin, would you would you step your way on over to the piano? Amen. I love you, brother, and I love Waffle House too. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a man that loves God that will leave Waffle House, not even change clothes and come to God's house. Amen. Give him a big hand tonight. Amen. <laughs> Let me close before he starts playing. Let me close by uh, Mark Rutland wrote about this. He said, when I was in, in undergraduate school, my Western literature professor was a young firebrand atheist. And he made no secret of his disdain for religion. And one day in class, someone asked him what he thought was the greatest poem ever written. This atheist, he said, shocked us when he said, I can tell you the greatest poem ever written. Psalm 23. And they're like, we thought you were an atheist. He said, I am. He said, but two years ago. Two years ago, my baby died. And my wife is a Catholic, and she insisted on having a priest do the funeral. And he said, I didn't want any such thing. I was angry at her. I was angry at the priest. But at the grave, the priest opened his Bible and prayed Psalm 23. And he said, I who believe not one word of it felt deeply moved. Some unexplainable wave of comfort swept over me. I don't believe in God, but I believe in poetry. And any poem that can move you like that against your own will is great poetry. Friend, if the Psalm 23rd Psalm can move an atheist, Boy, it ought to move us tonight. Amen. Don't you love the shepherd tonight? As Brother Quentin plays now, just love on the shepherd right now. Are you going through a valley tonight? Praise him that you're coming through it. You're going to pass through the valley of Baker. You're going to pass through the valley of decision. Joshua came through the valley of, of trial and testing. 
Jesus went through the greatest valley of all, the valley of death. Where he's gone, where my shepherd's gone, it's going to be all right. Amen. Can you sing something, anything? Love on him tonight. Praise him tonight. Praise him tonight. Down through the years. Oh, yes, Lord. The Lord's been good to He's me. He's my shepherd. You're going through a valley? Come forward. Let's pray with you tonight. Prayers will get you through that valley. The Lord's been good to me. Has he done? Come on. Down through the years. Oh, I know yes. that the Lord's been good to me. He has been. Come on down tonight. So Let's love on him. So good to me. Sister Judy, he's brought you through those valleys. You're coming out Sing better. It down through the years. He's my shepherd. The Lord's the ultimate to is my intimate. Sing it down oh, yeah. through the years. Come on, church, and love him tonight. I know the Lord's He'll dry every tear. Singing down through the years. Oh, I know the Lord's been good. He's bringing me. us through COVID. Amen. He has 